Good. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Danny, um, and all three um, uh, of you for, uh, for the excellent presentations and introductions um, to, to this, uh, this very complex topic. And we've had very different uh, 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 types of presentations. And um, I think what we should do now is, uh, is go to some questions and answers. Um, I propose to, uh, to take three questions at a time, three to four, and then to hand back to the, to the panel for, on, uh, for, for answering those, uh, those questions. Who'd, who'd like to start? You'd like to go first. Could you uh, introduce yourself as well yeah, before you um, ask a question? I'm John Rand from the University of Copenhagen. Um, I have two questions, one for Danny and one for John. I will start with John. Um, we know that a lot of these countries have done work based on Danny's and Hausman's work on finding constraints. So to which degree did they incorporate those in the decision making, their uh, analysis of finding constraints? And for Danny? Um, this inherent mechanism of manufacturing to uh, grow, uh, do we also see that in services? Right. Okay. Uh, over there. Thanks uh, <coughs> for these uh, interesting talks. Uh, I, have, um, I have a question related to, uh, uh, you started out and you followed up a bit on this uh, idea of, of, um, of sector policies, right? So you talk about in industrial policies as focusing on particular sectors, but I wonder whether this type of approach is still relevant nowadays if you, if you think about global value chains. There has been a huge reduction in, in coordination and communication costs, uh, which has led to a transition of how, how firms now do business. You tend to think of, uh, of uh, one of the most successful US firms, uh, the Apple uh, uh, company. It doesn't do any production anymore in the US, but instead it's uh, doing all the designs. So if you look on the back of the Apple, it's Designs in California, right? So it's the uh, if you now uh, think of, of what you want to do as as a country, you want to focus on particular tasks or activities, right? So so the U.S. Apple firm is no longer classified as a manufacturer by the U.S. national accounts; it has become a wholesaler. I was thinking uh, whether you could uh, uh, frame your industrial policies with respect to these particular tasks or, or activities uh, to be undertaken, especially in labor abundant African context. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. And the third question. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, uh, maybe the question to John here. Could you introduce uh, yourself as well? Sorry? Could you introduce yourself? Oh, uh, my name is Sajal Lahiri. Yeah. I'm at Southern Illinois University. Uh, the question is about the scope of the councils that you're talking about. Are they just for, to talk very nitty-gritty microeconomic policies relating to their industries or policies about uh, the tax policies that he was uh, talking about, or even human capital policies that John Sutton was talking about this morning. Okay, thank you. Um, so we um, so there's three uh, different uh, questions or four questions and uh, one for at least each uh, panelist. So Lindsay, do you, would you like to? Uh... It was a general question to all, but I was just to say something. I mean. My answer would be that global value chains actually make a sector approach even more important um, because being able to access global value chains still requires um, in, in certain activities going through a certain sector. Maybe it's a bit less important in, or different in manufacturing, but in agro-processing and in um, high-value agriculture, it's still extremely uh, important. Um, then things were things focus on in terms of a fun functional and process upgrading and all these things that the global value chain literature talks about. I mean, there's lots of ways to maneuver within global value chains of how you can increase the income and wealth that an industry and firms can generate. So it's about learning how to maneuver within those global value chains. But I think your question linked it to another process, which is really coming out in recent work. Um, about the commodification of manufacturing goods and the decommodification of previous agricultural-based goods, which means that we do need to think about things differently in, ma in all types of manufacturing. While they may provide jobs, don't pr don't create much um, wealth. Uh, and then, in that sense, African countries can't look to manufacturing or any type of manufacturing good to le to create the kind of wealth it did before. But I still think sectors and in, in terms of targeted activities, what what do African countries need to do to create the kinds of firms that can enter into export markets and global value chains still requires a sector approach. But can I, when do we get to engage with each other? <laughs> in, in a minute, maybe, don't know. John. 
Uh, yeah, on this question of binding constraints, there is no evidence from the case studies that the work on binding constraints has found its way back through into the deliberation of the councils. And I think that's in part, again, the fact that much of that work has been sponsored by the African Development Bank. Since the councils are owned a bit by the World Bank, they've tended to be driven by the World Bank's agenda. Um, and that, of course, is one of their major failures, uh, that, that there's not an openness in the, in the process. I think it's also the case that it, it is symptomatic of the fact that different kinds of activities, even donor-sponsored activities within Africa, are undertaken by different elements of government. So you don't get a lot of communication oftentimes across these. But the question would be, why doesn't someone in the business community raise his hand and say, well, wait a minute, didn't we do this study of binding constraints? Shouldn't we talk about that? And that's a bit the problem, I think, uh, both of capture but also of the fact that the working groups are not working as well as, as they might, that, that you're, not, you're not picking up on kind of new items on, on the agenda. Yeah, back to sectors and picking winners and so forth. I take a much broader view of industrial policy, I think, than, than sectors. And I think actually, from the point of view of coordination mechanisms, it has to work at two levels. Um, it has to work at the level of broad strategic choices. And in fact, much of my writing about Africa over the last several years has been saying, the problem in Africa is not a problem of nitty gritty industry level industrial policy. It's the fact that you don't have a strategy. Um, if you, we take Danny's stuff, do you have a strategy for structural transformation? Do you have a strategy for promoting those areas of activity that have unconditional convergence? If you believe that there's learning by exporting, do you have an export push strategy? These are the sorts of things that are broad strategic interventions, but nevertheless are very important, and in most cases are simply not thought about. And the only point I would make here is governments make strategic choices every day through the budget. In Africa, they make strategic choices every day through their engagement with the donors. But do they have a plan? And the answer is no, they don't really have a plan. And I think some coordination with the private sector is useful in thinking through the plan, because it can identify some of the large scale issues. Then when we get down to the sort of squeaking wheel issues, that's where I think bringing it down to a much finer level of coordination makes sense. And Danny's point about courses for courses, I think, is, is highly relevant there. Um, so the scope issue, I think, is really one of trying to say, at this point in the development of this economy, what are the major issues that we need to address? Where are, to use any terms, binding constraints? And what is the appropriate institutional framework within which to do that? So it again suggests, don't import something that somebody thinks was a great idea because it worked in Korea, if in fact it's not going to work in, in Ghana. Okay, uh, Danny? I'm, in, I'm interested at, at, uh, about how, how strongly um, sorry how strongly John has come out against uh, doing business uh, indicators. Um, so I'm, I'm not I'm not a big fan of them. But I mean, there's there's it's interesting that I mean in in a way it, it shouldn't hurt you having those things. And but you know when you when you I mean, the story you're telling is once you have these things, then it becomes like you know sort of becomes an almost you know a, 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 a an irresistible dynamic that they turn into your priorities without um, sort of uh, digestion and analysis and um, but uh, you know ideally you know that's sort of one of the kinds of uh, you know sources of information you want to use in in an, in a diagnostic analysis of, of um, you know what your priorities ought to be um, but as part of that analysis, not you know, pr take that as, as presuming that that's, that's the answers are already there. And the interesting question, why does it turn out that once you have a piece of the, you know, an input into the analysis, it turns to the, in into itself the into the result yeah. and the objective, yeah. Um, the, uh, the, with respect to services convergence, so the, the short answer is no, there isn't um, unconditional uh, convergence in services as, as a whole. Uh, we don't have data sort of disaggregated. Ideally, if we had data, what I would like to be able to do is, is, is look at tradable services or some of the moder more modern services vis-a-vis uh, -vis other, uh, others. And my suspicion is that many tradable services behave like uh, the manufacturing sectors that, that I've, I've, I've identified here. Uh, but that's just a guess. What I do know is that 
that if you break the economy into manufacturing, non-manufacturing, with manufacturing essentially being the organized manufacturing part, the non-manufacturing part, the rest of the economy, the 90, 95% of, of the economy, uh, doesn't exhibit unconditional convergence, which is why, of course, you don't get unconditional convergence if you do this in the economy -wide, uh, with economy-wide data. Right, okay, uh, thank you very much. I, th I think it's um, maybe interesting also to, uh, to react to each other, as, as Lindsay mentioned, you started that. Um, so there, there is this um, um, discussion about this, these external, this externally supported investor councils, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the discussion that, uh, that Lindsay has hi highlighted, that you need to have the political settlement to, uh, to, uh, behind the, behind the uh, good and effective industrial policy, and also what Danny mentioned about the, the, th the three factors. So the, one of the questions, of course, is could these investor councils work at all uh, if they're externally supported? Um, uh, those you need a political settlement, and you need it. it all, everything needs to be homegrown. But but vice versa, uh, if you have built uh, only on the political settlement, uh, don't you run the, run the risk that these stay very inward-looking, and the, and and you don't import sort of for, uh, uh, foreign ideas and and foreign technology? I don't know whether you you, you three have any any thoughts on that uh, dichotomy. Lindsay. Well, I just wanted to. I mean. I don't disagree with all what they said, but I just wanted to bring some counterexamples to show how in the kind of approach that I was talking about can explain some things. And one in particular, I think, is on the, the Ghana example that you were talking about. Um, I work on Ghana. I've worked on Ghana for a long time and have done the study for, for our um, project. And I would argue that it's not really about... I wouldn't interpret it as President Kufour becoming bored. I mean, you need to understand what's going on within his ruling coalition. If someone is bored, it's, not, it's because their, their attention lies elsewhere. And the, the MPP party is intensely contested inside. Kufour had very limited authority within his own party. He was constantly battling to shore up his support um, by shifting around factions, by rewarding and punishing um, people within the party, as well at the same time as having a, a strong party outside and, and groups in society battling his everything. I mean, he's, it, we, I had that last slide I didn't get to go through, but when you have that kind of intense contestation, and I would say that Ghana probably represents one of the most extreme cases in Africa, of intense contestation within the ruling coalition at all levels, there's no coherence within the ruling elite at all. It means that his attention is elsewhere. It's in an immediate politics of survival. Um, and it doesn't focus on the kinds of things that need to be done because he's focusing uh, elsewhere. And we can see this in many cases of, of when he has money to pursue productive sectors, what does he do with it? And the same kind of thing. So just showing how you can use this kind of approach to have a different interpretation mm -hmm. on what is going on about why. And I would also say, I mean, our research shows that the, the president himself, him herself, I, we don't think is the key factor, having a president interested. We can see many cases in Tanzania where the president led an initiative that totally failed in implementation, due again to the internal politics of, of the ruling coalition. And then just um, to engage a little bit with, with Danny Roderick, um, on your last point about ideas, we have debated this in our group a long time, what role does ideas play, some of us. My own personal opinion is that my reading and understanding of, of East Asian countries um, experiences and elsewhere, is I'm not sure if it was the role of ideas or actually econ special economic opportunities that came with being close to Japan. And the same thing applies with China and this thing after. That, that Japan provided this kind of opportunity for shifting to export-oriented. And then some writers say, okay, there were ideas embedded with that, but maybe it was more the, the opportunity to do this um, which was much more strong, stronger than the ideas, because Japan provided the access to the US markets in the very beginning. And the same story is told about China in the hopping. So when we can have this debate, is it ideas, or is it these special economic opportunities, which the East Asian region, including Southeast Asia and China, has really had, in which Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, Latin America have not had to the same extent. And then you have to bring in the global economy in a way in which we don't in our model, but we're very aware about how it affects opportunities and external actors. Thanks. John. Yeah, let me answer Danny's question on why I'm so down on doing business. Um, Danny never had the opportunity, or I should say really the 
displeasure of sitting through meetings between uh, presidents of African countries and the president of the World Bank, in which the president of the World Bank pulled out his doing business book and said, Mr. President, do you realize that your country ranks 143 out of 187 on doing business? What the hell are you going to do about it? Now, the reason why that's a bad thing is not because league tables are necessarily bad, and certainly Danny's absolutely right. The more information you have in a systematic way in evaluating your regulatory regime makes sense. But it resulted in some very perverse outcomes, and I'll just give you one. For many years, Rwanda was one of the top 10 reformers in the world on doing business. One year in about 19, uh, I guess it was around 2003, 2004, they dropped off the top 10 list. Paul Kagame called together 70 of the most senior people in his economy, people who ought to have something better to do, and put them together as a working group to find out how they could game doing business the next year so that they could then be once again in the list of top 10 reformers. That to me, if you're a development institution, is a cardinal sin. You do not divert the attention of government from doing serious things in order to have your publicity machine derail economic progress. So you have to think of that. Now, just to be fair to the World Bank, they have something else I think is fabulous. The Trade Logistics Index, I think, makes perfectly good sense. But the point in terms of the councils was that this was really a circularity. We have this neat thing. Our president really likes this thing. We're going to make sure that the councils become the means by which this thing is implemented, and we're going to keep score for the councils on the basis of the thing. That just destroys any possibility that this could be a coordination mechanism, recognizing Lindsay's point that that's part of one size fits all. I mean, there's a line in my paper which says, look, when you looked at the original World Bank blueprint, it looked like the Blue House, which is the capital of Korea, where President Park had his famous meetings with the heads of the Chai Bowl, papered over with the language of business, government, communication of the 21st century. That was what it was. So if you have that, you're not paying attention to these kinds of issues. The only question I would have is, why was President Kafour foolish enough to agree to do it if he knew he didn't have the scope, except that you don't say no to the World Bank? So uh, c councils uh, <laughs> might work as long as they don't have a, a specific targeted agenda uh, predetermined. Pre pre uh, Danny, do you want to say anything on, 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 this, uh, on this point? Uh, no, no, I, I agree. Um, and I, I don't want to overdo the point about uh, the, the role of ideas in East Asia, but my guess is that um, if uh, President Park had uh, decided to keep uh, it, the South Korean economy closed as it had been under Sigmund Ray, and had followed um, kind of heavily sort of state-led autarkic uh, policies that 40 years later we would have said that the political logic was that given the threat, the military threat from North Korea that the country faced, that, that, this was the, uh, that this was the choice. And I think there was a similar change in ideas about um, how best to respond to the mainland Chinese threat in, in Taiwan in the late 50s. Uh, I think that was a change in ideas about how to respond to, to that threat. Um, and and I, I think the, the, the Japanese model and the trade opportunities obviously facilitated and, and, and greatly leveraged and multiplied the results that we had from the change in strategy. Uh, but I think it was, um, I think it was agency. All right, um, there's a there's chance for maybe one or two questions um, from, from the audience. Uh, yeah, the lady over there. Um, there should be a microphone somewhere. <laughs> it's a bit difficult to get to you, but could you introduce yourself as well, please? Thank you. Um, is it on? Yeah. My name is Chie Chopa. I'm from the University of Limpopo in South Africa. Um, the question, well, maybe just um, a point of discussion that I may have for, across um, for all the presenters. Uh, I just want to look at it from the point of view of, uh, say, regional integration. We, um, we are having, we're talking about the firms, and uh, these firms are expanding you know, into the region and uh, obviously focusing uh, in terms of uh, trade for these firms because they're, they're trying to expand as well. I'm just wondering, in your experience or maybe what you think uh, how this uh, state business relations or the councils actually uh, may have a relationship with this and how would you say, say in a regional grouping, 
is it how would one discuss that or would we move to discuss it at a different level because obviously you have different states you have different governments so how would this state you know business uh, relations or the councils how you know because for example john is talking about uh, why he doesn't like they're mm -hmm. doing business but when they're looking at that the world bank for example they're just focusing on president x but sometimes those countries are in a regional grouping so i'm just just yep. wondering uh, you know around that Very good whether question. you would have a comment i show one more hand here and then uh Question regarding the oh sorry, regarding the um, power of ideas and and what the panel would think what the panel would make of these what would seemingly be the kind of a new trend in the power of ideas with the emergence of so-called state capitalism and uh, resource nationalism and I asked this also in the context of the the, the charts that particularly uh, Danny Rudrick and um, sorry and uh, Lindsay used in terms of their uh, the triangle and I noticed that that uh, aside from state capitalism would pretty much subsume the triangle that, that you have, Lindsay. Uh, the role of finance isn't really um, identified within that. And obviously, just taking John's presentation, the role of uh, donor influence uh, relates directly to the financial question. And I just wonder if state capitalism and resource nationalism kind of uh, highlights the need for more attention on finance to provide the policy space for this experimentation that, that you were talking about in policy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so very good, two very good questions to, uh, to conclude, uh, particularly the, sort of the first one on sort of regional business associations and their role. They might be different from national business associations and uh, state business relations. And the other question about capital and, uh, and the influence of donors. So if you'd like to, uh, to finish off uh, sort of one or two minutes each um, and your, your final say in, the, in, in this session. Um, Lindsay, shall, shall we start with, uh, with you? Yeah, the question on regional integration is a difficult one. Um, I mean, there are lots of good economic arguments for it, particularly for the very small African countries who have very small domestic markets, therefore need to go to export markets, and also to have the kind of volume of supply. And you could think of really good examples, um, like northern Ghana and Burkina Faso should have a thing where the companies can work together and export what they're doing organic mango now. But politically, it's extremely difficult and to go into why it would take a long time. But um, there are also immense... I mean, so many countries, particularly like Ghana, are so consumed with this p politics of survival um, that liaising in an interregional way, I mean, ECOWAS anyway, as far as regional economic groupings go, is totally dysfunctional compared to the East African or Southern one. But even in East Africa, I mean, conflicts of interest are going to arise, like with Tanzania's new manufacturing, exporting, assembly appliances to other East African countries, that's going to create a conflict if they want to do that. And we see constant fights between Nigeria and Ghana over whose cassava starch or palm oil processing companies are going to have which market. So there are still immense conflicts of interest in politics around that that uh, have, have to play themselves out. I'm not very optimistic now. I think we have to see a, a role where um, domestic capitalist firms in these countries, and particularly in Ghana, or a country like Ghana, would come to have more clout um, before any kind of politics of regional integration might work. On state capitalism, I'll be, I'll be short. I th I, in some way, I think your question is predicated on a misreading of state capitalism, because, okay, don't have the triangle up there, but I mean, you know, there's lots of literature saying that in China and in other countries, state owned companies may be state-owned in nature, but there's quite a degree of separation. They have their own interests. I mean, they very much fit into a mutual interest model I was talking about. Um, same thing if we look at countries where party-owned businesses play a large role, like in Taiwan in the earlier period, um, and also perhaps in Ethiopia today. So, I mean, state capitalism doesn't mean actually that all those boxes are subsumed together. You still have these dynamics and that requires a much more nuanced reading of what is actually going on in these different forms of whatever is put in this box of state capitalism. All right, thank you. John. The regional integration story in Africa is really operating at two levels. One is at the level of the heads of state and this comes back to some of Lindsay's politics, in which everyone is in favor of regional integration. And the other is operating at the matter of reality in which nobody's doing anything about it. Um, 
I think there is a role for coordination mechanisms here, but it's coming back down to the very specific thing. If in a border crossing it takes five days for a truck to get across, and people know that there's an existing problem, you may be able to frame up business government communications, even on both sides of the border, in a way that focuses on that specific problem and tries to resolve it. The issue here, I think, would be that recognizing the difficulties of doing that with some kind of imported model, you have to, it has to be an African model. It has to figure out how you do that, but it becomes an accountability mechanism. And that's particularly important for the regional bodies, because the regional bodies today are really accountable to no one. There's high-level political support, high-level political rhetoric, but really no accountability, and they're not accountable to any individual citizenry. So I think there is a role in here for a kind of non-state actor to begin to try to push that agenda. But I'm a great believer in solving the small problems first, because I think if you do that, you create a dynamic of success. And we've seen that. I'm always fond of remembering that the most disintegrated region in the world is the Middle East and North Africa. Yet there's a power grid that runs from Morocco, basically, to Saudi Arabia that works with intercommunications, and as a result of nothing more than the will of one man, the minister of power in Egypt, who for 25 years got all of his colleagues, beat them up, and made them form a power grid. So that works. Nothing else works. You can do small-scale things, and I think that's the first step. Remember that the European Union is the result, whether you like it or loathe it, of the iron and steel community. So that, I think, is the... On ideas, let me just reflect back on this question of experimentation. I mean, I got to read the latest thing that Danny's done so I see where it comes into. But I think a lot of what we saw in East Asia, at least a lot of what the grizzled old guys who I was privileged to talk to back in the 1980s and 1990s were saying is, yes, ideas were important. But the way in which we got ideas was not in a big and abstract way. The way in which we got ideas was observing things that seemed to work in other places in Asia. And that may be your proximity story. And then thinking about whether or not they would work in our context and then trying it and seeing if it would work. And I'll be frank, the idea that all bad ideas were abandoned is certainly not true. But one of the hallmarks of the difference between the implementation of economic policy in Asia, I would argue, and elsewhere, is that, say, unlike India, which managed to hold to an economic model for 45 years that manifestly wasn't working, the Asians were a little bit more flexible in terms of saying, gee, it looked like a good idea, but it doesn't quack like a good idea. Let's get rid of it and try something else. Very good. Danny. I just, I really don't have anything to add except to say that if, if the Africans should go the way of the European coal and steel community, I suggest they stop before they get to the single currency <laughs> state. That's, um... Right. Thank you. Very good. Thanks very much. Um, um, so this uh, session comes to an end, a uh, session of uh, broken wheels, uh, triangles and ideas. Um, and um, what we'll try and do is, is bring together the session of, uh, of, of, of yesterday and, and today um, in, in sort of a publication uh, moving forward. But let us uh, thank uh, very much uh, John, uh, Lindsay and, and Danny.